Thirteen years ago, the world came under threat of domination as a floating fortress descended from the sky. However, just when all hope seemed lost, the world was saved from the invaders by the heroes of justice known as the Dragon Keepers. With the world's safety now secured, the Dragon Keepers decided to take the next step in their careers and made the smartest business decision I've seen to date. They monetized violence. Now, every Sunday, they hold a showdown against the invaders that draws in a huge crowd all over the country. It's so big that it even has theorists working overtime to predict what the invaders will try to pull next time. Heading into the stadium, we meet this guy who has run into a couple of Rangers interns before he could get to the stands. They tell him to watch his own risk since they won't be held liable if he gets caught up in the battle. But that's just a technicality since there haven't been any real human casualties since the first battle 13 years ago. They try to convince the guy to try out for the ranger recruitment program since it's not actually as hard as most people think to become a ranger, but that doesn't mean he'll be as strong as the dragon keepers, so the guy isn't really enthused. Afterwards, they show him to the stands, and after a while the event begins as the dusters emerge from their fortress and make a crash landing in the middle of the stadium, ready to fight with their secret weapon. The people in the stands are excited to get their weekly dose of hardcore violence, and they don't have to wait long for it as the rangers arrive soon after. The tiger monster the dusters brought as a secret weapon, says, is a monster made of the collective grudges of all the tigers on Earth, so it's going to give all animals on Earth tiger stripes and create chaos. It may sound stupid, and it definitely is, but tiger is still a dangerous monster. So once he gets offended by the way the crowd is staring at him, he sends some dusters to target them for no reason. However, to prevent any potential lawsuits, the two interns have been tasked with protecting all the spectators, so Suzukiri stands to hold off the dusters while Sakurama is in charge of getting the people to safety. While those two take care of damage control, the Dragon Keepers take on the Tiger as it launches an explosive attack that sends them all flying. They say Tiger's power is greater than anything they have ever faced before, but the Green Keeper has a universal solution to handle this. Chuck a big rock at it. His attacks seem to have worked well for a moment as the tiger is completely crushed, but after a while, tiger gets back up and declares that it will take more than that to kill him, because he is immortal. He then takes on the form of one of the most powerful beings known to anime, truck and charges towards the rangers. The rangers form a human chain to try and stop tiger truck's charge, but they just end up getting run over all at once. Tiger returns to his normal form and the spectators are starting to get worried because the Dragon Keepers actually look like they are losing. However, the Dragon Keepers rise to their feet moments later and say as long as there are still living people to protect, they swear to never stop fighting for their safety. On the other end of things, we get to see how the Dusters are handling the situation and it seems like this whole thing was planned out from the beginning. They are expecting the Keepers to fire their special cannon at them and even have a whole speech prepared for when they lose, but then they realize that one of them, Fighter D, is here even though he wasn't supposed to be on shift today. As the Keepers fire their cannon, Fighter D breaks formation and runs out into the incoming blast. And after it hits, we get flashback to what the Dusters were busy doing an hour before the showdown started. They were up in their floating fortress, panicking because they couldn't think of any good ideas for this week's showdown with the Rangers. It's tough because they are forced to come up with new ideas every single week, and they've been doing this for 13 years now, so they are simply going to run out of ideas at some point. Through the radio, they could hear that the crowd was getting more excited by the minute, so they have to think of something quickly to meet their expectations. But if you're wondering why the Dusters got stuck with the television producer job description, it all started back when the Dragon Keepers fought back against the invasion. They had killed all the bosses in the fortress, but they left the Dusters alive since they were mostly harmless. Now the Dusters spend their days in a time crunch to come up with good monster ideas to battle the Keepers with, so Fighter G takes it upon himself to come up with something and draws out a plan to create a giant muscly monster. Everyone likes the idea, but Fighter A rejects it because they can't go with such a vague monster. It has to have a theme or it will be easily forgotten in no time. Since what they need is a gimmick, Fighter L comes up with a cute cat monster, but that gets rejected as well since they need the monster to still be scary enough to strike fear into the hearts of the children. The Dusters feel exhausted since they can't come up with anything, but then Fighter D over in the corner suggests that they make a tiger monster instead. He's pretty sure they've never had a tiger monster before and it's ferocious enough to be considered a powerful opponent, so it's the perfect idea. Although they are still sure it's going to lose anyway. Fighter D doesn't like the fact that his comrades have given up on even trying to win at all. So he tries to urge them to maintain their hope that they may someday triumph over the Dragon Keepers. But the other Dusters don't seem to care much what he says. At this rate, he worries that they'll never actually complete their mission. 
But it's been so long that the others don't even remember what their original mission was to begin with. Their mission was to dominate the world entirely, so even though their bosses are dead, he still wants to achieve it. His ambition gets him nothing but mockery from his peers as they've all come to accept their mediocre lifestyle, but Fighter D can't come to terms with it, so he lashes out at them all. Later, as D is lying on the ground after his fight, he is approached by F who tells him he should try to be more calm since there's no point in fighting among themselves like this. Over the past 13 years, they fought with the Dragon Keepers a thousand times, but they haven't won a single battle, because on the day that they were defeated, they agree to continue to invade the Earth once every Sunday as part of a truce with the Dragon Keepers, but they can't let the people find out that it's all an act. The Keepers probably don't even see them as a threat anymore, so he should just accept that there's no chance of beating them. Fighter A steps up and asks if everyone is alright with them going for a tiger monster this time, and if so, someone should step forward to imitate the tiger while he takes a look at the encyclopedia to figure out what a tiger is. Fighter Z steps up and says he'll do his best, so he takes a look at the encyclopedia, and based off the description, he disintegrates himself and forms the best tiger monster he can think of. Back to the present, after the cannon hit, the dusters were all meant to reconstruct themselves back on their fortress to complete the defeat. But D stayed behind and began regenerating in the arena, so he could finally go for a victory against them. The rangers realize there's one duster left, and it's going to be bad for the image of a dragon cannon if people think it can't one-shot dusters. So Pink urges D to just go back to the fortress before the dust settles, so the crab doesn't see him. However, he is done with all these rigged games and wants to give the rangers a real fight for once. But he's still pretty weak, so I'm not sure it's going to make a difference to them. Since the crowd has seen D now, Red is forced to handle the situation, so he dashes in front of D and tells him he played his part well, but he shouldn't get delusional and think he can actually win. He's the villain in this story, so he needs to know his place. Red then slices him in half and the rest of the rangers fire a cannon blast at his severed body. Back at the fortress, Fighter F wonders why D never came back with them, but it says it's not surprising since there were a bunch of people like him that ran away because they couldn't handle the way things are, but as it stands, doing what the rangers tell them to do is their only way to survive. D later reconstructs himself outside the arena and one thing has been made clear to him after what he just went through. He isn't fit to be a villain with how weak he is, but if things continue to go on like this, then he'll always be a slave to the rangers no matter what he tries. As he says this, he changes into his human persona, which is the same guy we saw gaining admission into the stadium, and just as he finishes transforming, Suzukiri shows up on the roof and recognizes him. She asks what he is doing here, so he makes up an excuse about wanting to get better view of the battlefield from up here. She likes to come here for the view as well, so she believes what he says, but then she changes topics and asks what he thought about today's showdown. He admits that he thinks the Dragon Keeper is that strong, and he wants to be like them, so Suzukiri asks if that means he is willing to take the recruitment exam and become a ranger as well, and he thinks it might actually be a good way for him to grow stronger and defeat his enemies eventually. D heads to the Dragon Keeper headquarters later to sign up for the training course, and while he's there, he asks the receptionist if the Dragon Keepers are in the building right now, but he gets told that they aren't even though it's their headquarters. Moments later, he is approached by Sakurama who is excited to see that he chose to come take the recruitment exam after all. D doesn't recognize him at first, but after a bit, he recalls that he met Sakurama at the same time as Suzukiri. Speaking of which, Suzukiri shows up right after him and apologizes to D for Sakurama's overly friendly behavior. He just got excited after she told him that D would be applying for the recruitment exam, but there's no guarantee he would pass to begin with. Sakurama thinks it's rude to say that to D's face, so he tries to cheer him up by saying he believes he can pass the exam as long as he wants it bad enough. The encouragement is nice, but then Sakurama starts getting a little too close to D again, which he doesn't like because he is socially awkward, but also because fighters have naturally fragile bones, so all this hugging is accurately snapping his skeleton. While D was still panicking, he notices Suzukiri staring straight into his soul with those blank eyes of hers, and that's the signature look of suspicion right there, so D is worried that she may have caught on to the fact that he is actually one of the dusters. But she almost immediately changes her demeanor and asks if D would like to join them for lunch. Since she doesn't seem to show any signs of suspecting him aside from her just staring straight into his soul just now, D laughs to himself that humans must be really dumb to allow a monster like him to infiltrate their headquarters so easily. Meanwhile, back on the floating fortress, the dusters are passing the time by playing tic-tac-toe and Fighter A is absolutely destroying the competition when all of a sudden, 
He hits the bad news that the Dragon Keepers are pulling up to their doorstep, and it can't be just for a friendly chat. Red and Blue walk into the fortress, so Fighter A comes out to give them a compulsory greeting, but also to find out what the reason for this surprise visit may be. Red tells him not to be so uptight since they are in a truce, so there's no reason for him to be hostile towards them. However, Blue on the other hand is ready to be very hostile. He tells A that one of his dusters fell out of line during the last showdown, and he wants to know if everyone here was in on it as well. A denies having anything to do with D's betrayal, since that's something he decided to do despite warnings against it, so Blue calls out for D to reveal himself so he can receive his punishment. Unfortunately, A has to inform him that D actually hasn't returned to the fortress ever since the battle, so they have no idea where he is right now. Blue doesn't like that answer and accuses A of lying to cover for D, but A is a professional snitch, so there's no way he would ever put himself or the rest of his people at risk for someone who betrayed him like D did. Blue believes that he isn't lying, but he still isn't going to be satisfied until he has punished someone, so he nominates A to take the fall for this one. A is sweating bullets already, but Red stops Blue before he can do anything, and tells him it would be unfair to punish A for something D did, especially since A was betrayed as well. The only one at fault here is D who defected from the program, so they just tell A to report to them as soon as he finds D. But to prevent something like this from happening again, they are going to be taking some safety measures and have brought two of their men to act as supervisors to keep watch over what the dusters do in the fortress. One of the dusters is greatly opposed to the idea and starts lashing out over it because he doesn't want to lose all of his privacy. The others try to stop him, but he believes he has a right to speak for himself. However, Blue doesn't think the same way and slaps the freedom of speech right out of him. He threatens to kill every single duster here if they continue being so annoying, so A pleads with him to stop and says they'll do as they are told. Red likes the sound of that since this is the way he believes things should be. The weak should listen to the strong and not fight back, and the strong shouldn't have to worry about the weak disobeying orders. So anyone who is caught going against him again will reap retribution of equal intensity. All traitors will be killed without mercy and Red smashes a pillar to really make the message clear. As the dusters watch in horror, F thinks to himself that he can't afford to do anything stupid like what D did. But at the same time, is this really what he wants his life to be? A never-ending cycle of servitude to the Dragon Keepers. While the dusters are being threatened into submission, D is having a steak for lunch and showcasing his lack of table manners at the same time. Brushing off his odd behavior, Suzukiri brings up the question he asked earlier about the rangers not being at their headquarters, and in fact, they are almost never actually in the building as you are much more likely to find them in their respective garrisons. Sakurama adds to the conversation, saying the duty of the rangers isn't limited to only needed for monster extermination. They also help the community and sometimes assist the police in settling conflicts, but ultimately, none of this would be possible without the support of the public. After hearing everything Sakurama has to say about public opinion being really important to the rangers, D absent-mindedly talks about how they would probably hate it once people find out that the showdowns are all staged. As those words leave his mouth, he realizes that he has messed up, but Suzukiri gives him a way to recover by asking if he is referring to a conspiracy video that claimed the battles between the rangers and dusters were all fake. D plays along with them and says that's what he was talking about. But this interaction at least confirms to him that the low-level rangers in the force don't know about the showdowns being staged. A few moments later, the kid that Sakurama had saved during the last battle calls out to him to say his thanks for being saved. He wants to get a picture with him to commemorate the moment. D watches as people gather around to celebrate the rangers, and he understands why they love their lives so much because who wouldn't if they were showered with praise so often? After a while, the rangers' lunch break is over. So Suzukuri tells Sakurama that they have to get back to work. They say their goodbyes to D, but as they leave, he overhears Suzukuri say she's going to head over to the Red Garrison so he gets an idea. He calls the kid from before over and asks if he can see the photo he just took with Suzukuri and Sakurama, and once the kid shows it to him, he takes a long and hard look before using the image as a template to transform himself into Sakurama. He does this in front of the kid, which isn't the smartest move since so he gets scared and runs off, but with his face now matching Sakurama, D is able to get into the Red Garrison by tagging along with Suzukiri. She had to come here to deliver a letter to Red Keeper, but she says she didn't expect that Sakurama would want to come along after all. D laughs it off to keep his identity hidden until he can enact his master plan. He's going to use a knife to strike down the Red Keeper, once he gets within range, but he's probably forgetting that the guy is a literal superhero. 
He asks Suzo Kiri if she'll let him deliver the letter instead, and after giving him a stare of serious judgment, she complies and hands the letter over to him. They arrive at the identification gate and Suzo Kiri gets them to open the door for them. And as the door opens, he goes over his plan to take off Red Keeper's head as soon as he finds an opening to do so. But then again, he realizes that he has never actually seen the Red Keeper's face before, so he has no idea what he looks like. As they enter the garrison, they are both stopped by this clown Red Ranger who asks what business they have here. D tells him that he is here to give Red Ranger something, but the guy throws a curve ball when he tells D that he is actually Red Ranger. D has no idea who Red Ranger really is, so he believes what this Joker says immediately and thinks it was really lucky to get this close to Red Keeper so soon. He reaches into his bag to take out the knife so he can attack, but before he does anything he'll regret, Suzukuri calls Takeda's exaggeration, saying he may be a senior ranger here, but he's not Red Keeper. Takeda says he might as well be called Red Keeper since he's the next in line for the job, but that aside, he can't ignore the fact that Sakurama clearly just tried to pull something just now, so he grabs his arm and asks him for an explanation. D realizes he is screwed since there's no way he's going to be able to talk himself out of this one, but he also can't fight back because Takeda is way stronger than him. And to make things worse, it seems like Takeda knows Sakurama personally since he says he can tell something is off about Sakurama's behavior today. And it's not helping that D doesn't know anything about Takeda other than his last name, so he is moments away from having his cover blum as an imposter. But just before things get out of hand, Suzukuri steps in and pulls Takeda's hand off D and tells him it's not nice to bully other people. She also tells D to stop being stubborn and just give Takeda the letter so they can leave already. It should be fine that way since he is the future Red Keeper after all. Takeda is a sucker for flattery, so he takes a liking to Suzo Kiri after she acknowledges him as the future Red Ranger. As they leave, D is having a mental dilemma over the fact that he was too scared to act back there. Although, he knows those guys were way stronger than him, so attacking would have just gotten him killed, but that doesn't make the shame of running away any easier for him. As they are leaving the garrison, D notices a poster hung up on the wall and it clearly displays the face of Red Keeper, who is the same person who comes up the elevator at that exact moment. As Akabene walks past him, D finds himself blurting out the words Red Keeper, and since that's him, Akabana turns around to answer him. This is exactly what D came here for, but despite being right in front of Red Keeper, he can't bring himself to attack him, and just stands there frozen. Suzukiri comes to the rescue once again and drags D, out before he can draw any further suspicion to himself, so Red Keeper just takes this as an encounter with a star-stricken fan. Outside, Suzo Kiri scolds D for speaking to Red Keeper all of a sudden like that, but that aside, she tells him to hand over the knife he was hiding. D immediately complies, but he starts wondering how Suzo Kiri knew he had a knife on him to begin with. As soon as he gives it to her, she slices off his head, meaning she knew he was a duster all along. After regenerating, D asks her how she found out his true identity, but it was easy to figure out since D is way too weak to be a human. If he isn't careful, he'll blow his cover, which is why she has been covering for his blinders all day. At the very least, she can say he did well to stay calm and not lash out because if he had, Red Keeper would have just killed him on the spot. Since Suzukiri is a human, D refuses to listen to her and attacks, but he just gets his head slashed off over and over, until he finally gives in and is willing to hear her out. She wants both of them to work together for their mutual benefit. She'll teach him a way to defeat the rangers and in return, she wants him to help her destroy the ranger force completely. Just then, the real Sakurama pops up around the corner because he has been looking for Suzukiri everywhere. D has turned back into his human form, so Sakurama doesn't suspect anything as he tells Suzukiri that there has been a monster sighting out in town, so all rangers are told to be on high alert and prioritize civilian safety. D thinks it's strange for a duster to be out when it's not a Sunday, so since he believes something must be wrong, he runs off to go check it out. Over by the river, D sees F being chased down by the Red Squad and gets headshot by Takeda, who says he should stop making this so difficult and quit regenerating so much. F has only come down to the surface because he wanted to look for D, but since he can't find him anywhere, he decides to go back to the fortress after all. Unfortunately for him, Red Keeper arrives on the scene and tells him he won't be going anywhere this time. He gave him a warning, but since F broke the rules, there won't be a second chance for him. Red Keeper pulls out a divine artifact and D recognizes it as the same one that was used when the rangers wiped out their bosses. Red Keeper performs the red dragon attack on F, but this seems like overkill for one duster. 
FC's death coming his way, but he kind of expected this to be the way things would go if he came down here. At least it's better than living as a slave to the Rangers, so if he resolves to take the attack head-on. As a result, is killed with no chance of ever coming back and D could do nothing but watch from the sidelines as his friend met his end. Sakurama shows up a minute later and he is confused by what just happened since the Divine Artifact Red Keeper just used was definitely different from the usual one. D knows all too well what that weapon is capable of as he had seen Red Keeper use it to kill the bosses of the Floating Fortress, after which he proposed a deal with the Dusters so they could coexist peacefully. The choices were to join them or die and Red Keeper certainly wasn't bluffing back then, but it still makes D angry when he thinks about how easily his friend's life was taken from him. As D leaves, Sakurama chases after him and offers his condolences about the duster that was just killed. D acts like he doesn't know what Sakurama is talking about since he is pretending to be a human, but Sakurama somehow already knows that he is a duster in disguise, so he asks D to stop any evil plans he may have been plotting. D asks how he managed to find out, so Sakurama explains that he overheard the conversation that he and Suzukuri were having back in that alleyway. He once again urges D to give up on any evil plots he's up to because justice will always prevail. However, hearing Sakurama talk about justice, D becomes greatly agitated because he has had to live as a slave for the past 12 years and he's sick of it. He is going to do whatever it takes to make sure that this messed up ranger organization is brought to the ground by the time he's done with it. Normally you would expect Sakurama to defend the ranger organization, but he just smiles and congratulates D on passing the ranger exam and invites him to work together to change the organization for the better. He agrees that the way things are done isn't good right now, but if they work together, then surely they can fix it from the inside out. Sakura extends a hand to D, but he slaps it away and says he hates Sakurama with every fiber of his being. They are enemies, so he never wants to speak to him again, and as he leaves, he tells Sakurama that he isn't qualified to be a ranger. D later meets up with Suzukiri and she's glad he chose to come to her for help, but D makes it clear that he is just here to learn how to take down the rangers, and once he has that information, he wants nothing to do with Suzukiri anymore. After he says this, Suzukiri proceeds to casually slice his head off in the middle of the restaurant. And somehow nobody sees this, but as he regenerates himself, he is angry because his cover could have easily been blown just now. It may seem like a reckless move, but Suzukuri just wanted to make it clear that she can blow D's cover whenever she wants to, so it's in his best interest to be nice. D finally settled down, so Suzukuri begins talking about her plan to defeat the Rangers. She tells him that the key to beating them lies with their divine artifact and goes into further detail as she explains that there are five different divine artifacts. They are transformed items that the Dragon Keepers can use to kill immortal monsters, but they also give the Dragon Keepers divine powers. So in essence, her plan revolves around doing something to those divine artifacts. The Ranger Force may appear to be strong, but they ultimately just rely on their strongest five members, so a single if something takes one of those core members out of commission, then the whole organization would come crumbling to the ground soon after. While that may be true, D doesn't think it's going to be an easy task to get his hands on the Divine Artifacts, since the Dragon Keepers most likely keep them well guarded. The only way he can think of to get close would be to try stealing them while the Dragon Keepers are asleep, but even that probably won't work. Suzukuri mentions that there's one other time when nine of the Dragon Keepers have their real Divine Artifacts on them, and that's the Sunday showdown since they can't bring their real weapons to a fake battle after all. On the day of the showdown, the rangers have begun arriving for the battle, but up in a tree outside the stadium, Suzukiri and D are waiting while D transforms himself into a perfect image of Red Keeper. Suzukiri praises D for being able to perfectly copy human faces like this, but it's a little distracting, so he asks her to let him focus. Suzukiri keeps talking though and asks why the dusters didn't do it more often if they were able to mimic humans all along, but mimicking humans just happens to be something that D is good at. After he is done transforming into Akabane, he heads into the base to find the Divine Artifact. He is receiving instructions from Suzukiri through his earpiece, so she starts giving him directions to get through the passageway. D can't see anything, so he asks how Suzukiri knows the location of everything in the room, but she doesn't give him a straight answer to that question. D also finally asks why she is helping him if she was a ranger as well. So she tells about how she hates it when dramas always have a clear-cut winner and loser, so she feels bad for the so-called villains in this case since she can't bring herself to cheer for people who always win no matter what. D stops listening to her as some rangers come walking down the hall, so he straightens his posture and plays the part of Akabena. 
The rangers can't tell the difference, so they all stand at attention as he passes, which D finds comical. He continues down into the hall until he finds the stairs which Suzukiri tells him will lead to the artifact's storage room. However, as he enters, he finds Tokita sitting there and now has to really act his heart out in order to keep his cover alive. Without missing a beat, he tells Takeda that he needs to use the divine artifact to transform again, so he needs Takeda to move out of the way. Takeda immediately complies, but as he passes D, he can tell that there's something off here. He starts probing by asking how Red feels about having to kill those pesky monsters every week, but D plays it cool and responds the same way Red would before finally unlocking the door with his finger and heading into the storage room. Suzukiri congratulates him on a job well done, but now that he is in, he still has to find the divine artifact. But it turns out not to be that hard since it's just sitting out in the open in a bucket. This seems a little too easy, so Red starts thinking this must be a trap. But then again, it could just be that the dragon keepers are being careless because they don't actually see the dusters as a threat. D has finally gotten his hands on the weapon that has been tormenting him for years, but immediately after he gets his head blown off by Tokita, who was able to tell that he wasn't the real red from his smell alone. Since D has had his cover blown, he has no other choice but to fight, so he tries warning Tokita that he should think carefully before he acts, but Tokita wasn't paying attention and had already pulled the trigger again. He doesn't see any way D could possibly win this fight when Takeda is the only one with a weapon here, so he keeps shooting for his own enjoyment. After getting his full of murder for the day, Takeda goes to pick up the divine artifact so that he can kill D once and for all. D is shocked that there's actually someone other than Red that can use the artifact, but Takeda hasn't exactly used it before. This will be his first time, and who better to test it out on than a duster? D begs him to stop because he doesn't want to die, but Takeda sees no reason to give D any mercy. However, since mercy is off the table, D pulls out a bunch of dynamite he had stashed away on his body, and he threatens to blow both of them up if Takeda tries to attack him. Since Takeda doesn't want to die, he puts the artifact down and asks to talk things out like civilized people, but D ain't got time to be civilized, so he immediately goes for the boom boom option. This causes Tokita to let his guard down out of fear, providing the perfect opportunity for D to smash his head in with a nearby hammer. D has now successfully stolen the divine artifact and caught his first murder charge, so Suzukiri is praising him for being stronger than she had expected, but all the praise is only irritating him even though he should be happy about his first actual victory. He makes it to the roof as they had planned, but things take a turn for the worse as he is confronted by Red Keeper himself. He tries to play it off since he still looks human. But Red Keeper has figured out that he is a monster, so that isn't going to work. Red Keeper tells him to return the divine artifact to him and go away, but D finally has some confidence in himself, so he isn't going to back down now. He tries attacking Red with the artifact, but Red is too skilled to be taken down by his amateur moves. He grabs the leg of D and tosses him into a water tower. But D uses this to his advantage and makes his regenerating arm pull the water tower down onto Red. Red is honestly impressed by how much power D can utilize when he puts his regeneration into play, but this much won't be a problem for him since he is able to strike the tower away with a metal pipe. D then has his arm and the artifact blown away when Red throws the pipe at him. D immediately chases after both, but in the end he could only save one and chose to save the artifact. Red finds him using that D chose to save the artifact instead of his own arm. He commends the effort D is showing right now, but he honestly finds it quickly unsightly because he is nothing but a loser. D retorts that he is doing pretty well for a weak duster going up against Red Keeper, so he wants to be taken seriously in the fight, but Red just laughs because there's no way he would go all out in a fight without an audience. But with that said, he has his audience right here as the news helicopter that was following him has arrived. Right now, thousands of people all across the country are eagerly watching and waiting for Red to defeat D. D isn't going to go down without a fight, so he prepares to make his final stand, but then Red falls to his knees for the drama and acts like the battle from last week did some damage to him. However, is all pretends to make what's about to happen next. The Rangers are about to jump D. Once they have all gathered around him, they give their speech about how they stand and protect the world, and if the invaders don't like it, then they shouldn't invade their world. Pink mentions that he looks like the same duster that went against the script last week, and even though Red can't really tell the difference, he thinks this is a golden opportunity to take out a traitor for good. He tells Blue to use his divine artifact to kill D and to make it look flashy, but D wants to at least fight Red if he's going to battle to the death. 
Yellow mentions that Red used his divine artifact on F the other day, so it may become a little boring if they keep using their ultimate attacks on regular looking dusters. To avoid losing viewers, Green suggests that they change things up for once, so they offer D a chance to be captured for the audience's entertainment. D obviously doesn't want to do that, so Red switches back to the idea of killing him. Blue uses his divine artifact to inflate D and make him fly up into the sky, but as D is about to face his death, he hopes that another duster stands to fight against the dragon keepers in his place. D explodes in the sky, and another Sunday showdown has come to an end, so Red walks over to his divine artifact that's in the ground and tries to grab it, but it immediately disintegrates. He is struck with the horrific reality that D must have transformed his severed arm into the artifact and used it as a decoy, but now the question is where his artifact is right now. Elsewhere. We see Suzo Kiri placing the divine artifact in a hiding place while she expresses her disappointment that D ended up dying and he did manage to steal the artifact from Red, so she's grateful for that. Meanwhile, back at Blue Headquarters, something terrible seems to be happening as the rangers are all being massacred at random by this thing. This was the end of episode 3. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to not miss the next part.